guys have got across the Rhine and they're pushing forward very vigorously straight into the heart of Germany. The German army is suffering and what is approaching the arena is what we call a Kampfgruppe. And quite successfully in the desert, it's a recce vehicle, it's designed to have good cross-country capabilities. Uh, it's armed with a two centimetre gun and uh, an MG34. And there's another of these at the rear. Now the whole thing about reconnaissance is go and have a look, find the enemy. Don't, if you can avoid it, get shot at. If you're in a recce vehicle and you've got rounds clanging off the outside, the chances are you are doing something wrong. But the American unit is pushing forward. They are under instructions from high command to find and fix the German force ahead. Behind the Greyhound is a Jeep, that's the command vehicle. And then you've got a Dodge weapons carrier with a 50 caliber machine gun. has been sprung. The MG42 is firing. They are scoring hits on the soft American vehicles. On the Chaffee is pulling forward. What's he going to do? Is he going to try it on? No, the Chaffee has thought better of it. He's coming under fire and he is pulling back to await reinforcements. So effectively it is round one to the and you can see entering from the left hand side of the arena we have a Sherman. Um, a bit later on in the afternoon you'll hear quite a lot more about the Sherman but this is the most prolific produced um, tank of World War II with the exception of the Russian T-34. Over 50,000 Shermans were produced and here they are. Part, another part of the formation is moving forward. There is another Sherman. And behind that is a very familiar vehicle to anyone who knows anything about the US Army in World War II. It's an M16 half track armed with a quad 50 cal uh, machine gun. Now, this is a ferocious weapon. It was designed as um, a light anti -air. Suitably sedate speed for such elderly vehicles. It's interesting to point out, um, the Jeep, for instance, in the front was capable of 60 miles an hour on the road, as was pretty much the, the Dodge. Uh, the Jeep claimed to be able to do 50 miles an hour cross country. And a company called American Bantam very quickly produced the winning bid, as it were, but then realized almost immediately that they weren't capable of meeting the demand. The American Army said, yep, yeah, we like it, it looks good, it does everything we want it to do, can we have several hundred thousand, please? The American Bandit said, well, we can't do that. So the order was passed on to a company called Willys Overland. That's why we tend to call them Willys Jeeps. The Dodge here was very much a, a, a private initiative by Dodge. They put it together, the American Army, they didn't have a three-quarter ton prime mover at the time. It wasn't, it was kind of non-standard weight, if you will. Dodge put this together using pre-existing parts and came up with an incredibly robust vehicle. Very, very good cross-country. Experimenting, it actually pals up with the Russians. They sent their engineers out to a place called Kazan and they work with the uh, other pariahs of Europe as they were seen after the First World War, the Russians, Soviet Russia, and they cooperate in helping design and test vehicles they call uh, the gross tractor, the big tractor. These are code words uh, because they are not supposed to be building tanks because of the first. training tanks that are armor plated, are given guns if they go to war, Mark 1 and Mark 2. For the Germans, that's called the Panzerkampfwagen uh, 1 and 2. The Europe has been restored mainly in Poland and uh, sometime soon, over the next few years, uh, it will probably end up going back 
to Japan to a new military museum that's opening there. Um, so we're lucky to have it here. But the Hargo, the Japanese, they've got a heavy tank in the early 1930s. They import a British tank. Uh, that tank, petrol driven, catches fire and some of the crew get badly burnt. That leads the Japanese, it's called bell crank suspension, but there's a tube between those two sets of bogies, as it's called, um, and that tries to dampen down the rocking effect that you'll see as that vehicle drives along. Um, it was notorious for making some of the crew sick. It's a particular type of Valentine that was converted so it would float on water. This is a DD. They call them DD's duplex drive, two ways of driving them. When it goes past you, if you look at the rear of it, there's actually a propeller, and that can engage with the engine, realises we're gonna need vehicles that can float across rivers. In Britain, we've even tried that in the first World War, we're trying to float a tank. Um, what he does, he starts with a little light Tetrarch tank, and it's got something called a Chrysler multi-bank engine in. I've said earlier about radial engines, aeroplane ones, the American industries are making as many engines as they can. Aeroplanes have the priority. So planes first, same in Britain, Churchill says tanks are secondary, let's get more fighters to defend ourselves, bombers to get back at Germany. Um, so tanks in Britain have secondary uh, importance. In America what goes on they end up getting other companies to make new engines, not just aeroplane engines, for the tanks. And uh, that particular one, you get five engines bolted together, Chrysler car engines, with one central crank. They had to make the tank a little bit more. seen the M16 before, with that um, four quad mount 50 caliber machine guns. The one I'm gonna talk about though is that M18 Hellcat, the one that's uh, banging away there. Um, that's another vehicle that's not a tank but the Americans in 1940 as we were saying earlier they realize now they're going to be involved in the war they make the Sherman and the M3 Grant as vehicles for their new armored divisions with the idea of exploitation they're going to be the ones doing the advances but what happens when enemy tanks go the other way what are we going to do about that so they've got two anti tank guns which you can take to where you think the enemy are coming. But the Americans come up with the idea of the tank destroyer. 41, the first ones are being issued to the Red Army. The problem for the Red Army at the time, Stalin has killed 30,000 of their officer class. They are decimated um, in terms of their leadership. Just when, in the summer of 41, the Germans invade. Now, that T-34, the original ones went into action with a smaller gun, 76 millimeter gun. This is one that was built in response to the German Panther tank that they see in 1943. They have a new model tank, the Russians decide, shall we build it? T-44 it was going to be called, but quite sensibly, instead of stopping all the factories, they say, no, let's do an evolutionary role and just build the tanks, carry on building them, we're just going to give them a newer turret, so that turret now has a number of later in 43, and it sees out the Russian army to the end of the war. Lots and lots made, estimates around 70,000 of them. It's also the most knocked out tank in World War II, because they suffer enormous losses at the, hand, at the hands of German anti-tank gunners, Panzerfels, etc. And these are used by the Russians almost like in the West we might use a hand grenade. If you need 20 in the world, because again, they're smaller, lighter, and that of course goes down very well, especially if you're in a country that doesn't have, um, you know, much in the way of infrastructure, you don't want too many uh, roads being chewed up. Now down the far end, that tank moving off there with that beautiful, beautiful engine though, that's a British Comet tank. It's a cruiser tank, we finally get our act together towards the end of the war, as I mentioned earlier, Churchill says planes are much more important.
be honest, it carefully, ladies and gentlemen, because the main difference in designation of the Shermans was the power pack in the back. And these have got very different engines, they're pushing them around. Initially, tanks were powered by aircraft engines, and the first engine to be put into a Sherman tank was the Continental Radial. It was an aeroplane engine, and as I think David mentioned earlier on, if you imagine a kind of vertical radial engine where you have the cylinders in a circle, but arranged vertically as it would be, say, on the front of an aircraft or on the, the uh, wings of an aircraft, that dictated the size and shape of the Sherman tank over the last time. She's got a clique armour welded to the outside. The first chunk at the front covers the ammunition stowage, the back covers the fuel. They're going. Um, they're also, there's a, an embargo uh, by the UK and the US on them buying new tanks, and also the Soviets are supplying the Arab nations with T 3485s and S on a Sherman. But what you have to do is you have to enlarge everything to take that in, and they pick that T 23 turret. to the wonderful engine notes of these vehicles driving around.
Uh, it went out of service, they reckoned it got a dirty gun. Too many fumes in the, uh, in the camp. A lot of other countries carried on using the Scorpion and some of them outgunned them with even bigger guns. There's about a hundred different variants of it out there. The turret was reused on a number of other countries' vehicles. The Austrians had it all sorts of countries. Centurion. They didn't really like them. They thought they were too under-armoured compared to something like a Centurion. But in the background, they were worried in case, what if we could never buy a tank at the war? Let's start a program to make our own. In the 1930s, they made a couple of tanks under licence to their vehicles. After the Second World War, Germany is a divided country, east and west. Germans made that Leopard tank, and that tank is a fast tank, you can see that. Big MTU diesel engine, that same British 105mm gun, same and everything else. But what they do is they don't bother about too thick armor on the Leopard one, they think speed is going to be their main protection. The particular one, very confusingly, he's got a British gun on because Royal Ordnance in Britain offered any country that bought the Chinese. see it with the Type 59, you can definitely see it with this T-72. It's a low tank, it's an attack tank. They wanted lower profile, uh, therefore you're less of a target to be seen and hit. And they do that. Certainly is. Uh, it can push out to technically 80 miles an hour, although I've had rumours that it's gone faster, but that would be uh, against the rules. <laughs> and uh, the whole idea is deep reconnaissance? Yeah, deep reconnaissance, long range stuff. It's strategically mobile, which means that if you want to move it to another country, we don't need to put on the lodge, not. Uh, but there are heating elements inside there, so heating pipes which the, uh, the girls and boys can put up their trouser legs, essentially, which warms them up, which is quite nice. And the opposite was true in Afghan, etc., that you end up with sort of cooling suits because the other extreme is, or air conditioning, because vehicles... The terrain is absolutely awful for armoured vehicles. It's a few inches of top soil. Earlier on, the upgraded um, version of 432 the idea of Warrior is it's fast, as you can see, because it's going to have to keep the infantry on with the new generation Challenger 1, then Challenger 2. Tanks that are much faster and much more mobile. I'll turn it back down and swing it back down again. And that gives that smooth ride. As you watch it go around, you'll see those wheels go up and get forced straight back down again. Enemies can cross the river. It's spent 15, 20 minutes on the snow. through the same system of mobility kill, in other words you can disable a vehicle 
or do you say is it K kill for knocking one out completely? Yeah, so we have K kill, which is the vehicles destroyed. We have M kill, which is mobility kill, and also have an F kill, which means we've destroyed its firepower capability, so it's no longer a threat. So uh, you hear on the radio a lot, right, right, I've been F killed, I've F killed this vehicle, which keeps things nice and simple. And the idea there, of course, is even whatever your weapon systems, if you can disable a tank, back to what we talked about earlier today, um, whatever gets to a point where we can lose all power, everything is gone from the top, it's still fine. A number of bridges, the number 10 and the number 12 bridge. The number 10 bridge has a gap crossing capability of 26 metres and can be launched in under two minutes. The number 12 bridge uh, can be launched in 90 seconds, although this only has the crossing capacity of uh, 13 and a half metres. Each of these bridges can be used in conjunction with each other to create a, a larger bridge. It can also ford rivers uh, to a depth of five metres. modified Charger 2 chassis, uh, the idea being that the uh, cooling group is located to the rear of the vehicle rather than the traditional top uh, because of the bridge. It can also work in conjunction with the Trojan and the Terrier engineering vehicles, again operated by the Royal Engineers. From here, the engineering call sign on the ground will declare the crossing point open and begin to marshal across the friendly forces. Start